Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the World Trade Center Los Angeles and the UK Consulates Bridging a Sustainable Economic Future Between the United Kingdom and Los Angeles webinar. Uh, delighted to have everybody here today. We have a very exciting conversation. Um, we're just going to wait a couple minutes until all the participants can join, and then we'll get started. are still joining, so I'm going to wait about one more minute and then we're going to get started. Good morning, everybody. My name is Stephen Chung. I'm the president of the World Trade Center Los Angeles and also the chief operating officer for the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, on behalf of the World Trade Center Los Angeles and the UK consulate, I want to welcome you to the, the, um, uh, this webinar of bridging a sustainable economic future between the United Kingdom and Los Angeles. We have a very exciting program with a lot of great speakers uh, ready to dive into the details of this um, really important topic for both regions. As many of you already know, over the last um, decade or so, Los Angeles has been moving quickly forward with a lot of our environmental goals. And uh, now that we, with the new administration, uh, with the Biden administration entering the re-entering the Paris Climate Agreement, there's a lot of new opportunities that's available for all of us. And what we like to do is explore this opportunity to see what we can do between the UK and Los Angeles as we're building a future sustainable economy with more sustainable jobs for both regions. And we are going to explore a bit more in terms of what the government policies are, as well as what the private sector are doing. So today you're going to hear from a number of different individuals uh, with a lot of great uh, inputs and information about what we can do collectively together to address the climate uh, issue that we're facing as a world, but also from a local level. Um, what we can learn from each other. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, the Consul General of the United Kingdom, Emily Cloak. Um, Consul General Cloak is a British Consul General in Los Angeles. She's a senior representative of the UK government in Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and Hawaii. So it's a big region. And uh, we're delighted that she's here with us today. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Emily Cloak, the Consul General for the British Consulate. Emily? Hi, thank you so much, Stephen. So I'm delighted to be here today to hear this brilliant panel speak about leading a sustainable future at the UK and LA. An opportunity to hear about how the UK and LA are creating an environment to partner with industry on ambitious climate goals, companies doing great things in this space, and to explore opportunities for cross-border trade and investment in the green economy. Climate sustainability and reducing emissions in line with the Paris Agreement is a top priority for the UK government. The UK will co-host COP26 in Glasgow this November. It will also use its G7 presidency to advance the climate agenda and harness the G7 strength to provide momentum in the run-up to COP26. The benefits are numerous. So cleaner air, healthier community, sustainable economic growth, energy security, and a safer, more stable climate. We believe that clean growth is the significant growth opportunity of the 21st century. The UK and US are natural partners and among each other's biggest investors. The UK is the second largest foreign investor in Southern California and an even closer partnership can help us rebuild our economies after the pandemic, helping businesses grow, spurring investment and creating jobs. On climate, as a colleague said to me yesterday, and I, I smile as I say this, while the climates of the UK and LA are very different, we are totally aligned 
on climate. At a state level, California is a leader in driving and delivering US climate ambition. For example, it was the first US state to join the Powering Past Coal Alliance created by the UK Canada Partnership and LA has also joined, also has ambitious zero emission vehicle targets. At city level, LA is a global leader with its Green New Deal and climate measures there include cutting water use, installing publicly accessible electric vehicle charges ahead of schedule, leading in areas on renewable energy and moving to zero emissions transportation with innovative initiatives like electric car sharing in disadvantaged communities. Mayor Garcetti is a friend of COP26, chair of C40 Cities and Climate Mayors and is in close contact with our COP president, Alok Sharma on COP26. The unique vantage point of our UK consulate based in Los Angeles is to help act as a conduit to build relationships, facilitate partnerships, share experiences and see where we can learn from each other. For example, the UK has partnered with Commotion LA over the last few years, helping to lead the way in building a sustainable future for transportation. Indeed, it was a UK company, Zeti, who won Commotion's startup competition with a fintech platform that enables the transition to EVs through financing fleets and associated infrastructure as a pay-as-you-drive on a pay-as-you-drive basis. And Zeti has been building momentum in LA and the wider US by reinforcing the importance of financial stability in adopting sustainable technologies. On green finance, the UK is playing a leading role in shaping the global agenda, aiming to increase private sector investment in green infrastructure, technologies, and services that will be needed to deliver net zero. And we look forward to working closely with LA on, um, on this area. Finally, it's worth mentioning that there are opportunities to incorporate climate objectives in wider things. For example, a UK-US FTA could support that. And on trade more broadly, we're working to increase our trading relationship between the UK and California. My teams across the consulate are engaging with private industry, government stakeholders, academia, and broader to ensure that the relationship between the UK, California, and LA is as strong as it can be. Today is a great example of how we can learn from each other and share best practice. And I am really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Consul General, and thank you for your remarks. Um, we're gonna be learning quite a lot from each other over the next few years as we're moving uh, into the future. And now um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, the Chief Sustainable Officer for the City of Los Angeles, Lauren Faber O'Connor. Uh, she's been a fantastic partner uh, for the World Trade Center Los Angeles as a great champion for the City of Los Angeles and the greater region. As the Chief Sustainable Officer for the City of Los Angeles, Lauren is driving the implementation of Mayor Garcetti's landmark LA, LA's Green New Deal, a global model for local action to confront climate crisis. We're excited to have her here today. Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's so wonderful to see you and Emily, wonderful to see you too. I'm so glad to be part of this. Um, any opportunity to work with, with you all is a real treat and really exciting and, a, and important way to be spending my time. So really happy to be here this morning and be talking about this very important topic and topic very close to my heart, the mayor's heart and uh, one of LA's great you know, value sets here. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit quickly about uh, LA's Green New Deal for those that are not familiar with our, our plan, um, as well as kind of what that means, uh, putting it in practice and how we're working with the private sector to deliver on a lot of these goals. So just next slide, stepping a, uh, taking a step back, really looking at, and you can just, I think actually, Mike, you can click through some of these headlines here, but you know, we are working under heightened urgency of climate change uh, right now. And I feel like every year I end up changing these slides and, and the, the headlines just kind of get more and more um, dire and overwhelming, but um, th it is also a, a source of, of motivation <laughs> uh, to understand sort of the, the race against time. And you know we know what it feels like to be in a race against time now in this pandemic. And you, know, you take a, a scale back 
um, and we are truly in a race against time um, when it comes to dealing with climate change. And so that has really motivated us, that motivates the mayor to act with ambition. Next slide. And that's what um, motivated him to put forward LA's Green New Deal. Originally, this was really about an, a four-year update to the 2015 Sustainable City Plan, which itself was an incredibly important landmark moment for the city, the first time the city's ever had a sustainable city plan. But just even four years later, between 2015 and 2019, so much had happened. Um, in terms of you know, the, the technology improvements, in terms of the political landscape, and in terms of the urgency of the science. And so it really was a, a, a look across everything that we were doing and raising ambition so that we could be really compatible with the Paris Agreement, especially understanding that, um, that we were you know, operating in a federal administration that was not supportive of that. So what does it mean to be um, compatible with a Paris Agreement? It really is about uh, taking on more aggressive goals, but accelerating action in the near term, ensuring that you know, we're kind of front loading the work because when it comes to climate change, the emissions that we are either emitting or saving now really matter to the climate. Um, and that we do that in a way that prioritizes equity, equity at its core, um, and that we are working to build a green economy that welcomes people all over the world and, and works for the, the workers here in Los Angeles as well. Next slide. I think that that really takes to, to heart, yes, what we kind of consider our key principles going forward. And next slide. Just to give you a sense of the breadth of um, LA's Green New Deal, we really do address everything from kind of the traditional environmental you know, sectors like energy and water and waste and transportation, but we also dive deep into um, housing and resilience and food, healthy food access, um, urban ecosystems and, and other areas that really demonstrate the, the synergies between kind of everything that we do <laughs> and needing to make all of our investments really sustainable investments. Um, but we can also, from a greenhouse gas, from a climate perspective, also boil down the work to what we call the five zeros. So a zero carbon grid, zero carbon buildings, zero carbon transportation, zero waste and zero wasted water. Kind of full stop, key, key uh, guide, you know, guideposts, key north stars for us are the five zeros. And we really see how so much of them interact with each other. But as I say, you know, and as folks are thinking um, who are tuning in, like these, you know, these really are our North Star is to get to zero carbon in these key, in these key energy areas. Um, and that really is, an, is driving our action. So I wanted to, uh, for the purposes of today, I, I was sort of thinking, how do I want to describe um, you know, our engagement with the private sector or what we um, are looking to, to how we're looking to attract more engagement from the private sector or what we've been doing in the past. And so next slide, you know, in thinking through the kinds of actions that we're taking that fit across multiple different sectors uh, to build that green economy and to welcome uh, private sector engagement, investment, leadership, innovation, all of these things are so key and core to the extraordinarily ambitious goals that we have set. These are world leading goals um, with, with really exemplary programs, I would say, that, that, you know, hey, in some places, in some cases we're learning from others, but we also know that everything we do in LA uh, has the ability to be a model beyond, way beyond our borders. And so I kind of was thinking about it as maybe three categories of LA being able to use it itself to create itself and its partners to create scale that attracts the private sector, um, proactively pursuing public private partnership and welcoming innovation, um, and then how we leverage our own investments. And so just a couple of examples here I wanted to provide um, on creating scale. I put down green hydrogen here because it's a very hot topic for us. Um, and I, I would like to um, commend to you all to tune in to the mayor's Facebook page tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So Mayor Garcetti's Facebook page tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, to 
to participate in and, and watch the, the event that we'll be releasing what's known as LA 100. This is a three year study to get LADWP, our municipally owned utility to 100% renewable energy. And why that matters is because this isn't about kind of buying green power on the market. The, the, our utility is, is the kind of utility that owns and operates kind of the whole system from soup to nuts. So we, we own the generation to create the electricity. We own and run the transmission lines, the distribution lines, and we deliver, obviously we deliver that electricity to our customers. We also run the grid that ensures that all of that energy and all of that innovation is meeting need, supply and demand 24 seven reliably. That is all done by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Most of that is done for the rest of the, the, the state by the California Independent Systems Operator, the Cal ISO. So when we say we're going to 100% renewable, we're actually doing that to an entire grid, um, not just to a utility, but to a grid. And the, the report, which was done in partnership with and really by uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, a national lab of the Department of Energy, um, and our new, our new Department of Energy Secretary, Jennifer Granholm, will be participating in this event tomorrow to release the findings. And one of the findings, uh, I mean, an important key finding is that 100% renewable energy is absolutely achievable. And so for so many folks who are tuning in, who are involved in the clean tech sector, you know, we are, we are completely convinced and, and completely committed to reaching 100% renewable energy. We've seen it now, it can be done and it, it, there are multiple pathways to get there and to get there very reliably and affordably. One of the areas of, of um, that was identified for increased innovation need is around green hydrogen. And I, I, I raise this as LA as, as one city having the ability to really revitalize this market and this technology through our own investments because we are that big. And, and I've got a picture up there of the Intermountain Power Plant out in Utah, which right now serves as our final coal uh, investment. So this is a coal plant currently. And originally it was slated, you know, when folks were going from, you know, coal to natural gas, it was slated to be a smaller natural gas power plant. But now it's really turned into a focus around green hydrogen. And that when it opens in 2025, it will be at least one third blended green hydrogen at that point. And it's an incredible opportunity for scale because that, air, that site actually has, um, has salt caverns situated like natural salt domes that um, are, you know, the depth of the Empire State Building, a hundred of these. So an incredible place to actually store green hydrogen. So this is really becoming a marquee national project for green hydrogen that is also informing how we look at our in-basin power plants, our power plants inside the city. So really LA being able to, through its own sheer scale, um, you know, turn markets toward green energy. But we also do that by partnering. So uh, we started the Climate Mayor's Electric Vehicle Purchasing Collaborative. And Emily mentioned Climate Mayor's with the, which the mayor co-founded and chaired until actually just a couple months ago, now Mayor Turner, Sylvester Turner of Houston has become the chair and the mayor remains on as a co-chair. Um, which is super exciting to have the mayor of Houston uh, chairing this effort. But what the EV Purchasing Collaborative does is it basically harnesses the purchasing power of hundreds of cities and other public authorities to buy from a single portal to buy electric vehicles for our fleets. So today it's 245 public fleets, cities, counties, you know, are using this portal to buy upwards of 4,000 vehicles thus far. And we're moving into buses, school buses, transit buses as well, all available you know, through a streamlined process to accelerate the procurement and the transition to electric in our fleets. And then of course, public-private partnerships or what we do to um, enhance innovation. This was actually a, um, a project that was launched at Commotion LA, what was this, two years ago now? <laughs> Which is really the first of its kind to serve as a hub for transportation innovation in LA. The mayor 
has always um, ensured that LA stays at the forefront of innovation, particularly as it relates to the transportation sector. And so this is intended to really drive investment and jobs in mobility into the city. And, and we do that through an ideas accelerator. We do that through urban proving grounds, welcoming new technologies, welcoming innovators to physical spaces in the city to test out their technology. And then of course, leveraging our own investments. So folks, maybe if you're involved in, in clean energy, rooftop solar, um, you may be uh, familiar with the, what is now the largest feed-in tariff program in the country, um, which offers a favorable rate to developers to build large, uh, large solar projects in the city so that we can, we can basically, you know, of course, bolster our, our um, in-basin supply of renewables and engage, you know, the many, many commercial properties in being part of our sol the solution in Los Angeles. And then finally, I wanted to just mention the um, port of Los Angeles and our efforts to really uh, move to a zero emission operations in the port. This is something that requires international collaboration. The mayor through C40, I'll mention in a moment, is actually working with ports and cities with ports around the world on moving to zero emission operations. But we actually put forward a request for information to the private sector on clean truck finance. That, that um, RFI has closed, but we are absolutely open to be talking to anybody who is interested in helping us think through how do we scale up to accelerate the transition of our, of our truck fleet. And I mean the hour with a capital O truck fleet of all the operations um, that you know the ports that are or the trucks that are coming in and out of the port need to become zero emission as soon as possible. And the mayor set a goal for 2035. And a couple years later, Governor Newsom then followed with that goal just last year, which is fantastic. A quick word about C40 before I close. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, and Emily, thankfully, you you brought this up already. But you know, he is. Um, he is working as the chair of C40, recognizing LA as a, a global city and leading a, a, a network of over seven of, of 97 mega cities around the world, but really has over the last year during the pandemic taken the reins of, of demonstrating that any recovery to the pandemic and the recovery that we demand must be a green recovery. We cannot return to the ways that we that we operated before. This is a once in beyond a generation, I hope, um, opportunity to remake our economy toward equity and toward sustainability. And so really raising the voices of the largest cities in the world toward a green and just recovery. And then I'll end with just a note next slide about our work with the UK. Um, there's a very special relationship between the UK and LA, well beyond the special relationship of the UK and the US. And that's not just because the mayor lived in the UK for a long time and I worked for the UK government for a long time, but notwithstanding those things, Emily did lay out a lot of ways where we are very similar. So I will not, um, I will not repeat what you laid out, but will very much agree and echo everything you said is that we see ourselves as partners, as co-innovators, as ways to, as, as desired partners to work together in both of our jurisdictions to really further what are very, very commonly held values and shared goals. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, and I, I was reminded with the picture that you just shared that was uh, at Second Home, if I'm correct, uh, in the UK, where uh, some of us actually were with the mayor as well for that uh, trade uh, mission. And uh, it makes us miss traveling also so much. So looking forward to the opportunity to be able to go back. Uh, thank you again, Lauren. Uh, next, we have Jennifer Austin, the Director of Strategy and Policy at COP High Level Champions for Climate Action. Um, the, the beauty of having um, uh, these meetings but via Zoom is that we can have all these very important individuals that don't have to travel all the way to Los Angeles to do the presentation. So we're delighted to be joined by Jen Austin to be able to present uh, some information uh, about her work. Um, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Jennifer Austin. Jen, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, real pleasure to be here virtually. And you're right, there's a real convenience factor in being able to Zoom everywhere, though it is a bummer not to be able to actually get out and about and see some of these beautiful cities, whether it's California side of the US or around the UK. Um, but a real pleasure to be here and joining this conversation. As Stephen said, I'm with the High Level Champions for Climate Action, which um, if you've never heard of is a UNE title with the best of them, but is a, a group that has a mandate from the UN, from the parties to the Paris Agreement and from the UN to organize and work with the non-state actors. And so everyone who is not a national government who can't be formally a part of the Paris Agreement, recognizing the importance of businesses, investors, cities, states, regions, civil society, local governments in actually executing the Paris Agreement. It was also decided in Paris that they would create this position of high level champion to help bring together, mobilize, and then channel the good work and leadership of the non-state actor community into the global conversation to make sure they were you know, a supportive part of that conversation, able to be part of the solutions in ways that you've already started to hear about here today. We clearly have a big year ahead of us. Um, you know, the was going to be the five-year deadline from Paris would have been 2020 last year. That COP has been postponed, though a lot of important work continued last year. And now we're looking in 2021 at sort of what would have been five years on from Paris. Uh, we also, you know, based on the science, know that we're on the doorstep of a really critical decade for climate action. And so broadly speaking, to get to net zero emissions by 2050 is what's required in order to keep alive the chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. That basically means cutting emissions in half in the decade ahead. And so we're at a critical time in which there's growing momentum, both among countries and the non-state actors, the businesses, cities, states, et cetera, committing to long-term net zero. And very importantly, it's time to get concrete and specific about what that means in terms of action in the one, two, five, and 10 years ahead to make sure that we're actually making the progress that we need to make in this decade to be on course to get to where we need to be. So COP26 at the end of this year is a really important milestone. There are a number of other big meetings along the way, including, as was mentioned in the opening, the UK is also presiding over the G7 this year. And so we'll see that climate is at the forefront of that agenda. The Biden administration is hosting a leader level summit on climate on Earth Day on April 22nd, one of the first leader level summits in a long time on climate, uh, where they have said that they will put their own new climate target forward at or before that summit. So certainly some really important milestones for the countries of the world this year with all eyes on what that level of ambition will be. Importantly, continuing to see how much growing momentum there is among the non-state actors, the businesses, the cities and states, and that's the work that, that we're putting together. One of the big pieces of our agenda this year is to build what is the largest coalition of non-state actors committed to net zero and what we call the race to zero. And there are now over 3,500 cities, states, regions, businesses and investors who are committed to that race. We intend to grow that significantly on the way to the COP throughout the rest of the year. And what that is, is an umbrella campaign that brings together some of the leading net zero initiatives and campaigns that are already out there in the climate community. They all share a similar set of characteristics, which is that you must commit to net zero by 2050 or sooner. There has to also be an interim near-term target. As I mentioned, how important those are, that has to be in line with science. You need to have a plan to get going. And all of these initiatives have a commitment to transparently transparently reporting on progress along the way. I'm pleased to be joined here today by representatives of entities, all of whom are part of the Race to Zero. So starting with the city of LA, um, and it's great to hear from Lauren, a number of the details underlying that overall commitment and the, the work of C40. So the C40 Cities Initiative and some of these other cities initiatives are a core part of core one of the coalitions at the heart of our race to zero campaign. Also I'm um, gonna speak mostly about sort of the businesses opportunities to get involved. And so joined by representatives from businesses today, both of which are also part of the race to zero through the business ambition for 1.5 campaign. And so for businesses to join the race to zero, there are a number of avenues. The big sort of global businesses mostly are committing through this business ambition for 1.5 campaign, which as I said, in, requires a commitment to net zero by 2050, as well as a science-based target that is validated by the science-based targets initiative. And so we're seeing more and more companies coming out and making commitments, climate commitments of all sorts. It is 
important that those are transparent, that those are objective, that people can understand what they are. And, you know, if we're honest, that we're sure that those aren't greenwashing. And so part of the, the goal of this campaign and working with these credible sort of third party transparent initiatives is to make sure that there's a level of ambition that is very real behind what those companies are doing, including so that it can build confidence amongst their peers and others. And so that one of the key elements here is recognizing that broadly speaking, more and more entities are recognizing that we need to make progress and that we're starting to make progress and there's momentum towards and support for taking climate action. It's still the case that it's quite complex to get there and figure out how to decarbonize every sector. And so there's a real value in knowing that the that peers around the ecosystem are also committed to net zero, understanding what some of the details of those entail. And so as Lauren shared the five zeros, you know, knowing how ultimately to decarbonize the global economy, to cut global emissions in half this decade and get to net zero by 2050 means decarbonizing every major sector of the economy and breaking it down to understand how each actor how it fits together. So in addition to having their own goals, figuring out where and how it can play in with others, the climate solutions are endlessly complex and so that different entities have a different role to play and that there's an inertia that we're in now, which makes it hard for any one actor to sort of move beyond business as usual, though we realize that the benefits of doing that together will be really important. So again, part of rallying these commitments into Race to Zero is to recognize, help people see and be seen as part of a peer group in which there's a growing cohort of businesses and actors that are acting. And then specifically to start to break it down into different sectors and figure out how to work together to overcome some of the sort of chicken and egg problem that has people feeling as though they get a little bit stuck sometimes. And so, you know, one example of that, which also um, builds well on some of what Lauren was talking about is, you know, LA obviously is a big global city. It's a port city. And so, not only actually the green hydrogen story is also closely linked because green hydrogen can be an important fuel for shipping. So LA is a, gl a global port city. Part of its net zero commitments include emissions reductions commitments for the port itself. If we look around the race to zero family, Maersk, the world's biggest shipping company has a commitment to net zero and it's committed to getting net zero ships on the water by 2030 so that it can be decarbonized entirely by 2050. Importantly, they set a commitment quite recently to get net zero ships on the water within 10 years. They just announced within the last couple of months that in fact, they're gonna have the, they're going to have achieved that part of the plan within two or three years. So a full seven years sooner than they thought shows the power of people setting powerful goals and starting to work with others to achieve them. Then at the same time, as Maersk is putting those ships on the water, not only do they need to know that they can come in and out of a port that will have supportive infrastructure, they also need to know that they you know, will have business and people who are demanding those things. So you look around the Race to Zero family and you see that we've got some of the world's biggest retailers, whether it's Amazon, Walmart, General Mills, some of these big companies who have also made commitments to net zero. So they need to break those down to the equivalent of their same sort of five zeros. What does this mean for their own products? What does this mean for moving those products? And then, so that in includes a shipping component. So you start to see how by bringing these actors together and having some sector specific conversations, you can see that there will in fact be someone on the supply side, but then someone on the demand side, investors who are supporting this, local cities and infrastructure that are supporting this around the supply chain. So ultimately for COP, our goal is to grow the number of actors committed to net zero through the race to zero and to bring those together to drive what we're calling system breakthroughs. And that really does mean building up sort of a critical mass of actors from around the sector and to reach a real tipping point. And I think sort of the my two closing points is as you start to reach a tipping point, you start to realize that actually we're hitting rates of exponential growth here. And it's important to recognize for all actors that you know often this change feels quite slow for a while in the earliest of days, and it feels very bold and ambitious to put those commitments out. And then you start to realize that you see it gathering pace and that exponential growth takes off quite quickly. And I think what we're seeing in a number of sectors right here and now in, you know, in this year is that they're starting to hit that exponential growth phase as they reach a critical mass of actors all around. And so part of this COP is to really help bring those together and show, show where that momentum is and certainly where we need more, you know, to help us analyze where we need more collaboration and, and more good work, but also to help more and more folks realize the pace of change that is happening. The 
that's pretty much the overview. I think it's worth mentioning that in the context of the global recovery, which is you know still the world that we live in, is you know study after study have shown that these climate solutions are really set to be drivers, better drivers really, of economic growth and jobs than reinvestments in business as usual. And that's without even the comparison and counting the benefits for climate, health, and society. So it is absolutely a no-brainer that recovery plans should be green and climate aligned and making sure that those are both for companies and countries will be a really important part of sort of laying the groundwork for the decade ahead. It's, it will be the biggest decisions made around policy and spending in many places for the decade ahead. So we'll very much set out the path and the companies and countries that choose to pursue that climate aligned path will be best positioned to reap those benefits. Um, so that's really what I wanted to recap here for today. You know, sort of message to the audience is that this race to zero is on, it's picking up pace. It's going to be hitting exponential growth phases in many corners of the world. And so really pleased to be joined by some of those leaders on this virtual stage today and very much invite, you know, all the rest of you to join us in the in the run up to COP26, you know, in before Glasgow. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, and you hit on the few, few very important points that actually is helping with our transition into the next phase, which is our uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, but I do want to uh, address what you mentioned for a little bit, which is uh, the, the economic growth and jobs. Uh, as an economic development agency at the World Trade Center Los Angeles, we have a very uh, selfish interest to make sure that we can actually create more jobs. And uh, I mentioned earlier that we're also part of the LA County Economic, economic Development Corporation. And recently we released a report um, that looked at the devastation of what COVID-19 did to the LA economy. So just a summary for everybody, at 2019, the end of 2019, LA County had about 4.5 million jobs for this entire county region. Within the first two months of COVID-19, we lost over 716,000 of those jobs. And over the last few months, we've been getting some of those jobs back, but we're still over 400,000 jobs uh, short of what we were at 2019 um, at the end of 2019. So as we're looking at recovery, we see that the uh, economic future is gonna be very much tied into um, this uh, recovery phase where we can look into the sustainability future. And that's why the private sector plays such an important role. And that is why it's a, such a good segue for us to introduce our next uh, two panelists as well. So at this point, I would like to welcome to the stage uh, Catherine Perez and also Gerardo Rosco. Catherine is the Los Angeles City's leaders and associate principal with Arup, and um, she's an expert in urban planning, transportation, stakeholder engagement, and she was with us uh, in London as part of our trade delegation uh, a couple of years ago. Can't believe it's been so long. And uh, Gerardo Rosco is the vice president, executive clients, account manager for Jacobs. And he helps guide strategies to serve clients like utilities, transit agencies, healthcare, and public works. And together, we were uh, in, in London uh, supporting the mayor as he's pushing forward with a lot of the um, interaction between the UK and Los Angeles. Uh, and just one final note before I have the conversation started is that uh, UK is one of our top foreign direct investment partners. Uh, LADC and Water Center, we issue a report every single year quantifying the number of foreign-owned enterprises in uh, all of California, and there are over 2,400 UK firms already located throughout California, creating over 111,000 uh, jobs and supporting those jobs in this entire state. So this interaction is going to be uh, continually very important as we're looking at recovery. So ladies and gentlemen, let, let me bring on Catherine and um, Gerard, and then we're going to jump right into a question that also allows you to do a bit of self-introduction as well. Um, <laughs> Catherine Gerard, the, the first question, and maybe we'll start with Catherine first. Um, can you talk a little bit about any examples? And there's a question in the Q&A uh, aspect looking for that opportunity as well. Any examples of projects or activities that your uh, company has created because of the cl climate policy uh, goals, both in the UK mm -hmm. and Los Angeles around the world? And can you talk a little bit about the, some of the crossover between the two sides as well? Catherine. Absolutely. Good morning. It's good to see you, Stephen. And I really, first of all, appreciate the opportunity to speak and enjoy this great panel, but also hearing Lauren and Jennifer um, really kind of echo the urgency that I think we're facing right now. Uh, my name is Catherine Perez. I'm an associate principal with Arab and I'm the LA City's leader. And that role, I get to have the opportunity, the great kind of unique opportunity to, to work amongst the various kind of sectors that we uh, that we practice in, whether it's healthcare, education, infrastructure, uh, public-private partnerships. So I, I get a little bit of it all. 
Um, Eric was a uh, prime consultant working with Lauren's team on the development of the Green New Deal. So we're very close to that document as well as how important and, and pivotal, pivotal it was. We, you know, listening to Jennifer was really reminding me just how, how important it is for private industry to make it, these decisions to kind of be transparent, as she says, kind of make the commitments. It is, it is a difficult thing. In fact, Eric, we just made a commitment to net zero uh, by 2030 as an organization, and we're a global organization, and it means a lot for us. We are changing our systems, we're changing what we're doing, how we're doing it, and importantly, I want to say that it's 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 critical to take the first steps. I think Jennifer was right in saying, you know, it seems really big, and there's a, but you know, there's tools there. Um, the UN SDG goals, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them are there for you to measure your efforts against the things that you're doing. So you can actually be able to use them as a, as a guide. And that's what we've done. And so when you're asking about examples, I mean, what we've done is we've internalized this as a practice. So there are projects that we, when we bring projects into the into our, our office, into the work, into the, the kind of team, we measure up against what UN SDG goals does this help us achieve as an organization? And we cut across all the offices in the globe. So to Jennifer's point, I think it's really important that you know, private industry takes steps forward and it's in everything you do. It's in the, in the way you procure your work. It's the way in which you work at uh, uh, subcontracts and contracts. It's the way in which you buy your, your materials and even the food when we're back in our offices, Stephen, how you actually do the very daily practices of running your business. So um, maybe with that, we can flip over to Gerard and, um, and, and take some notes from, from where he's coming from. But we're very excited. It's, it's something that I think all of us need to do to reach the 1.5 goals that we've set for ourselves. Great, thank you, Catherine. Gerard, and uh, can I also uh, invite Lauren back to uh, the panel as well so we can have a conversation? Great, Gerard. Thank you very much. I can't seem to get the video going, but you can hear me, right? Yes, we yes. can. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, uh, Jake, as we live our motto, challenging today and reinventing tomorrow, and that comes through through our client work, through our, our uh, workforce safety uh, at every office, at, at home, uh, as well as currently is the practice. But two projects in particular uh, come to mind. Uh, we have been appointed um, by TFL, Transport for London, to undertake a full integrated impact assessment of the congestion charge, any changes coming about that for central London. And so it's helping them deliver the vision of the mayor's transport tra strategy and ensure a green recovery for London. So that goes in line, uh, complements our work for the Thames Tideway cleanup and other work that we're doing over there. And we're very happy to be part of that fabric over there and part of the solution. Here in LA, um, we have, uh, we're really proud to be awarded the sustainability engineering contract for the NTA, the mayor chairs um, currently. Um, and in that, we will design mission critical plans associated with waste management, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, decreasing air pollutants, uh, reducing solid and liquid waste generation, managing ha hazardous, wa hazardous waste, and increasing recycle and diversion from landfills, which is very important. So. The reason it's exciting is we're supporting Metro in its mission, its mission to provide leadership in sustainability within the LA region. But we also having, having, helping them achieve its zero waste goal in the transportation industry. We're doing this without compromising its core mission of moving people efficiently and effectively. And that's exciting for us because we, we, we like the mayors of LA and London, we walk the talk. We're very serious about that. And there's a lot of work to do, so uh, very happy. Great. Well, I, I'm going to jump right into our first question. Um, I think it's on everybody's mind, and we cannot uh, omit what happened in 2020. Uh, a lot of folks are are wondering, based on all the work that the globe and especially Los Angeles, California, has been doing prior to COVID-19, when it comes to sustainability, do you? And this is open for everybody feel that COVID-19 has actually set us back some when it comes to our environmental uh, policies and our goals and our action, or do you think it's actually stimulated even more discussion? Well, I would, um, I would be interested to obviously hear what Lauren thinks in terms of Los Angeles, but 
I think what COVID, and I think everybody understands this, um, has really highlighted the chronic and structural inequities in our cities. Um, and it's brought into clearer focus the impacts that these inequities have placed on the wellness um, and lives of residents. And so I think, and, and I love to hear what Lauren's saying around putting equity as a central principle. We're working with a number of cities in, in LA County and the issue of resiliency and equity have come forward as kind of foundational components so that as you're going forward and looking at this, you know, next stress and stressor, which we will all face, we all recognize we're gonna have some more more of these stressors come in and we're gonna to need to handle them better, but we need to change our course in order to, I think, respond more directly to our vulnerable communities and making targeted investments so that we can have measurable, positive and equitable outcomes. And I think that that's where we're, we're trying to take community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, and to, to Lauren's point, I think that this is, this is the time where equity and I, I would add resiliency are critical. Yeah, Catherine, I, I completely agree. I and mean, I think that, that Stephen, there's, there's maybe a little bit of both, but I, I definitely come out on the, the, the positive sort of in the end. I think this will, um, will be in an, an acceleration mode. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things on, on sort of the average person's mind right now about, about their own, you know, worry about their own personal health, their family's health, you know, and, and what's going to come of a, a paycheck or, you know, what the bumpy, rocky roads ahead, you know, closure, open, closure. It's it's a lot of things, right? And so in that sense, it's a little bit difficult to capture people's attention for, for these issues in, in the same way that maybe we had uh, a few months before <laughs> March. But I will say in terms of the actions, in terms of the solutions, that we need to pursue to, to both help people out of this pandemic from a health perspective and an economic perspective, as well as help ourselves out of the climate emergency. There's so much synergy there, that that's why I think ultimately the solutions, like ultimately we will prevail in accelerating climate action. And I think that will have a positive feedback in terms of what it means to to people right now. And so I think the opportunity to make those connections are stronger than ever, but we have to be really intentional about explaining the, this, this nexus, about explaining how, you know, we can solve multiple problems at once. And frankly, I think that's what people want their governments to be able to do and what business to do is to solve multiple problems at once and not say, we'll hold on one thing while we figure this one out and then we'll get to this. Doesn't, doesn't work for people, right? And so that helps us because that means that that's a, that's a charge, that's our remit um, from the public is to make sure that we're doing things at this, you know, doing multiple things at once. And whether it comes to protecting public health or stimulating jobs, you point to the same actions. When we've been thinking about like, what's our recovery plan? We keep going back to like, we have a lot to do in, in the Green New Deal, actually. Yeah, <laughs> and we're going to hit a lot of these same goals. So let's just keep going back to that. And like, you know, when public investments become available through the through the federal government, we know where to put them. Um, an example yeah, also is the American Rescue Plan, which was recently signed into law. Uh, part of that has $100 million for the EPA to utilize and identify uh, and address COVID-19 related disproportion in environmental or public health harms or risk in minority or low income populations due to vehicle emissions, air pollutants and other hazards. City of Pico Rivera is doing just that and the money's there. We just gotta go after it like Lauren says. <clears throat> Thank you, Jordan. I was gonna ask um, uh, Jennifer this question. Uh, we were, I think both you and Lauren previously mentioned the, the ports. Um, in Los Angeles, we're home to the number one and number two container ports in North America, controlling about 40% of all cargo coming in, into the United States by sea. So it's a lot of cargo that's been going through. At the beginning of COVID-19, all of a sudden we saw a big drop off. But since then, it's been climbing up and having record-breaking months every single month, including last month, which is another mm -hmm. uh, a huge month mm -hmm. for those two ports. With that, you can imagine the, the traffic and the volume that's coming in. And one of the things that you said, Jennifer, really resonated, saying that we have to set these um, 
kind of uh, uh, environmental goals that at the beginning might be daunting, but things start catching up. And then basically once you hit critical mass and at the Port of Los Angeles, I remember when uh, in 2006 or so, when we started discussing um, the cleaner action plan, really setting a $2 billion plan for the two ports to basically become uh, uh, more sustainable. And now uh, both Mayor Garcetti and Mayor Garcia have committed uh, both the ports to having a zero emission port. I think uh, the, the, the timeline is uh, 2050, if not before. And whether it's zero emission trucks or zero emission cargo handling equipment, and now what you said about you know Maersk and and and, and that sector is fantastic. So from a national and international perspective, when with all these great goals that are coming in, what are the, some of the obstacles and challenges that are preventing us from being able to reach those goals? Sure, it's a good question. I mean, I think first of all, that point just about how quickly things start to happen is really important, and you know, humans tend to think of, think of it linearly, linearly, and tend to underestimate the pace of change when something comes to change. And it's happened to us every time though. So because we know it's happened to us every time, we also can and should update the way in which we make our plans and the, the level of ambition with which we're ready to make them. In that, you know, it's very hard to sort of imagine the future because you don't quite know what it's going to look like and you don't, and exactly what, you know, how fast that may come to into existence. And then sort of you turn around, but if you look retrospectively and you turn around and sort of any piece of technology that's probably in it with arm's reach of anyone who's part of this panel or listening right now, if you thought what that looked like 10 years ago, you never could have pictured this thing. And so similar, you know, we know that's how technology is actually evolve, they sort of spend time in this R&D phase and then they hit a takeoff phase and that exponential growth phase. And there's something around just making sure that all the different actors are, are seeing that and recognizing because there is something, there's a real power in inertia around people are used to the way things are and there it's hard to imagine how quickly it might change and to be the one who's ready to jump into that future. And yet, if you go with some peers, including those who are on the supply side or the demand side are the users, investors, or sort of builders of that thing, and you sort of hold hands and jump together, you actually know for sure that you will get there and everyone will be better off there. So there is a real, like one of the barriers, is just sort of a coordination game. And ultimately at its core, you know, big global public issues like climate are sort of a global commons problem. And one of the biggest hurdles is just coordination. And so that's why, you know, in, in these ways, sort of these public specific commitments are quite important. Um, you know, equally, you can't just will things into existence. And so real financial commitments need to be made. We need a real understanding of what type of investment it takes now to get those, those payoffs and that, that exponential growth later. And I think, you know, one of the, again, that's why sort of, if you know the market will be there, you'll invest more, you know, more, more boldly in it. And so there is that element of making sure you're bringing the right people together and really collaborating, which isn't necessarily the thing that you think, oh, this is what businesses do, but recognizing that there's a better future we need to get to together. In fact, there are real benefits to that collaboration. And you're talking, there's still sort of competition to be best positioned for that zero carbon future. And so it still can utilize and unleash those market forces but recognizing that that sort of collaboration, understanding up and down the value chain is key. I think one really specific barrier that relates to this point is that often there are sort of almost pain points within the transaction sort of link, if you will, or the sets of decisions that need to get made where the costs, what feels like a cost of a low carbon thing is maybe particularly concentrated. And so if you look at some of the big you know, moving away from the ports example, but if you look at sort of steel, for example, or cement and some of these building materials that to make low carbon steel right now is on the unit per unit basis, quite a bit more expensive. One thing is of course, you just need to invest in that technology, bring it down the cost curve and get it there. Even so, you know, the studies show that essentially to build a city block or a whole building or a city block or a huge chunk of LA with low and zero carbon materials, in fact, won't be that much more expensive on the whole. But when you get into each decision and one contractor is deciding to buy, you know, this bar of steel versus this bar of steel, that differential feels large. But ultimately when it gets, you know, into what, the, what actually creates the value or price tag on a building, that becomes a pretty marginal amount. But in that moment, when that particular decision got made, it felt big or it loomed large because it's that particular transaction within a highly competitive low margins piece of the puzzle. And so there's a really important piece around timescales, but also kind of recognizing 
the burden, like where that burden falls in the value chain, if you will, or the decision lineup, and then recognizing, you know, ultimately policy is really important solution to this because policies can help make sure that that one pain point doesn't actually get in the way of the ultimately better solution, which is affordable coming to fruition. So it's things like that that are really quite key. And Gerard and, and Catherine, uh, you, when, a couple of years ago when we were uh, going to the UK, I want to focus this question more on the UK. We were exploring a lot of uh, great sustainable you know, kind of uh, potential, especially looking, what, uh, looking at what the UK did um, for the 2012 Olympic Games and what we can learn from them for our 2020 Olympic Games when it comes to transportation, when it comes to hydrogen. Can you talk a bit more about kind of your company's experience and interest in the UK market and basically where we can do the exchange between the two sides? Sure, and Gerard, I'll jump in. And by the way, before um, I get a call from the mayor of Long Beach, I wanna say that Mayor of Long Beach, Robert Garcia, good friend um, to Arab and, and what we're doing, his port, I should say Long Beach port is gonna transition to zero emissions by 2030 and on road trucks by 2035. So just for the record, uh, Long Beach, <laughs> Lauren, you can, if you ask. Um, and, and so in terms yeah, of- that's you know, too. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I just wanna say that it's not just, I mean, 2028 is an important goal. You know, Olympics are, and, and some of the work that I do is around the Olympics effort, but there's the 2026 FIFA game, there's the 2022 Super Bowl, and a whole bunch of stuff sprinkled in between there. So we have this kind of decade of rolling activity that we we need to kind of understand we you know and I and I appreciate the efforts that we're trying to make certainly uh, to kind of rebuild and reinvest in our cities because that's how how we're going to present ourselves to the world in Los Angeles but in terms of the partnerships that we have with the UK and how we can the sharing and caring I mean what I I think is really important is is as we're all been discussing the collaborations are critical. And I don't think that we have a shortage of ambition. I think that what we do have is kind of, in some cases, maybe the shortage of funding and maybe Gerard can help with um, getting uh, Senator Schumer to, to open that spigot a lot bigger because we're looking forward to uh, a huge, um, hopefully infrastructure investment that will really accelerate the US and Jennifer spill over to other parts of the globe as we kind of get back on our recovery and get back on our feet. But I do think, that the next kind of iteration will be very creative around partnerships, whether it's the federal state partners, whether it's collaborators with private nonprofit philanthropic entities. I think there's a lot of new people that are going to be part of this, you know, race to 1.5 because we're just not going to we're not going to get there unless we do have that kind of kind of arm to arm link um, with everybody moving together in one in one direction. So that's that's my two cents. Sure. We were very proud to be program manager for the London Olympics, uh, building on our experience with other Olympics in, ter in terms of repurposing, in terms of logistics, in terms of security. So we build on that by uh, helping other agencies with that knowledge. You know, the relationships are there. We recently acquired PA Consulting, helping the UK with their vaccine distribution and modeling. And so we're building upon that. Uh, we're going to meet with uh, Secretary Becerra. I can say Secretary now, not, not Secretary designate. So thank you very much. Um, so it's exciting. The future is bright in terms of what we can do in London and LA and DC. Got it. Unfortunately, we're um, out of time. I can talk forever about this topic. And so for those of you who've been uh, uh, a part of my panels before, you know, I always save the very, very tough question for the very last. And it's a lightning round. So I'll start with myself first. At the, uh, as we're able to recover from, from uh, COVID-19, we're all been dying to basically get back out there to, to travel again. What is the destination that you personally would like to go visit? For me, I'll start. It's actually COP26. <laughs> the, not, not only for that, that uh, it's coming in November in Glasgow, but it's because two years ago, I went on the West Highland Way in Scotland and I got rained out and never finished a path. So I would love to go be able to go back to, to Glasgow and then go to the West Highland Way to complete that path. So with that said, as a closing, uh, we'll go around. Um, we'll start with Lauren. Where would you like to go when we're able to travel again? I'm a practical girl and I'm going to set a, a realistic goal here and I want to make it to COP26 <laughs> and I will be, I will call 2021 a success if that happens and I'm confident we're going to get there. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Jennifer. 
I think I'm going to bandwagon. I have to say, I look forward to welcoming you all to COP26. Thanks, Jennifer. Gerard. I want to help the economy of Glasgow. <laughs> 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 and Catherine. If I can help the economy of Italy, I'd be happy to go and have go to Italy. I anywhere, anywhere in Italy. I just I miss I miss Italy. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it's great having you all and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. And I want to thank uh, the Consul General of the United Kingdom for her partnership and as well as the, the her office and BIT as well, the Department of International Trade has been a fantastic partner as we're moving forward. Hopefully there are going to be more and more of these conversations to link the Los Angeles region with the UK as we're looking at a specific example. This is just a high level discussion right now to open up the conversation or reopen up the conversation. Hopefully we'll be able to travel back to London, back to Glasgow and we'll back, to, back to multiple locations uh, in, in the world uh, soon. But till then, stay safe, stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you all so much. Stay healthy. Bye everybody. Thank you.